Welcome to another episode of the Love Not Fear podcast, your source of inspiration and actual insights with the aim to help companies to shape their culture where people come to work out of love and not out of fear. And today we have the perfect guest for this, Andreas Constantino, who is a, an entrepreneur for many years. Um, his first business was Slash Data, helping giants like Microsoft and Amazon understand developers through data. And he's also very, very active in EO, the Entrepreneurships Organization, um, running the largest event in Europe, the EO Unlimited Santorini, he was the chapter president in Greece, et cetera, et cetera. He also teaches on two universities for over 10 years. But today we mainly want to geek out on his new company, which is Breathing Culture, because this is, I think, the perfect fit for the Love and Fear podcast for business. So leaders can figure out how to create this culture where people come to work out of love and out of fear. Andreas, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, pleasure. So um, how about you tell us how you came up or why you have built Rethink Culture, what the mission is and how you achieve a great culture in the business? Yeah, so the story I'd like to tell is I used to be a, a micromanager or like Liz Wiseman says, an accidental micromanager. And um, accidental because I was well-meaning and in the surveys that we run, uh, one or two people every time said, you know, maybe Andreas is micromanaging, but I was looking back at those and saying, well, is it really true? And I don't really feel it. And uh, well, of course it was true, but it was a blind spot. And over time I learned to um actually more about myself um another point where i learned a lot about myself is when i had i made a really bad fire i mishandled a bad fire um, and and uh, that person left us a one star on glass door which we really deserved and uh following that i with the person that run our uh people and culture Sarah, we embarked on a quest of sorts um, to really not just improve our culture, but also our, and bless the rating, but also our, our culture. So over the next four or five years, and with a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> yeah, sweat and tears, but also thoughtful uh, practices like what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, we took it to a 4.6 out of 5 on Glassdoor, which is on par with, uh, you know, the, the top companies out there. <clears throat> and out of that experience, and, and at that point, I was transitioning out of Slash Data uh, and handing it over to another CEO. So I was thinking culture is my favorite thing, what I'm going to do next. And so I thought, what about really taking my learnings from creating culture and my passion for distilling complex ideas into simple ones and so that became what is now rethink culture and culture health score which is basically measuring uh company culture into turning it into numbers turning it into a kpi that you can use to figure out uh, what's what's wrong with your culture, how to fix it, how to create a ha healthier, happier environment at work. That's beautiful. That's, that's my journey in, in very, very few words. Very cool. Uh, I just did the the survey that you have for your for your mm -hmm. score uh, with my team at at UpCoach, and I'm very curious for for the results. Uh, one person wrote me back, thank you very much for this survey, very thoughtful. It made me realize like how appreciative I am for, mm, for, for our coaching team, which was, was, was very beautiful. I hope wonderful. others see it, see it similarly. <laughs> but I think, I think that especially at UpCoach, we have a really great, great culture, even pushing towards a teal organization um, in line mm -hmm. with the um, reinventing organizations model mm -hmm. of having a, yeah, almost a self-run company, um, which has been a phenomenal thing to do a little scary but very rewarding and i'm uh i'm curious how we can roll this out to all of my other businesses with, mm. with, with larger numbers you know with business with a few hundred people mm. how will this look there 
because we have like a very flat hierarchy at Upcoach, but in, in the bigger companies, it's more hierarchical. So yeah, with, with, with flat organizations, I've come to realize that it's not that they are flat and they lack structure, it's they lack hierarchy. And hierarchy is what we used at school, um, in the military, in any form of government. Um, that's in, in, in almost any business. But in flat structures, you still have structure, you have circles and mm. overlapping circles of people. And usually they don't have a certain central figurehead who's the manager, but they have different means for making decisions, for resolving conflicts, uh, for coaching and all of that. But still, it's a structure. And that was what I hadn't understood before. It's not flat. It's, it, it is flat, but it's still structured, just a different structure. Hmm. It's, uh, I talked to Haluk, the former president of EO in Turkey, and he has a teal organization um, in the chemical manufacturing space. Mm -hmm. And he told me, I asked him, like, what's the biggest issue that you're having with, with mm -hmm. this? And he said, like, the main struggle that I'm having is hiring people mm -hmm. that are willing not to, uh, the people that are willing not being able to hide. You know, because mm -hmm. like you can maybe hide from your boss, but you can't really hide mm -hmm. from your peers. You know, so like exactly. living living this transparency. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, he he told me the same thing when I interviewed me my on my podcast, and he said the hardest thing is finding people who are um, who have a strong sense of responsibility, because in the hierarchy you look for people who are willing to play along the rules of the company but when you work in circles you need everyone to stand up and take responsibility and find the first opportunity to to take initiative uh, and work towards the common goal rather than being told what to do uh, and it's probably a skill we're not taught explicitly because we're not taught to prepare for these kinds of organizations. We're told to be good children yes. and compliant citizens. And actually, I remember reading um, the first school for teachers was funded by industry with the goal of producing normal children that would follow orders basically yes follow what to, told. To, to build build soldiers and factory workers you exactly. know, so i beat them into compliance yes exactly. yeah yeah I've, I've i was a uh, i went to 14 different schools i got kicked out everywhere my parents raced me without <laughs> authority so i was like i'm on the polar opposite i did not fit I <laughs> that's why you that. ended up uh, building a teal organization right? yes I, I guess so it's it's it comes very natural to me uh and yeah, yeah, it's but it, I, I believe that I want to unschool my daughter and not send her to school. Mm. Um, just like hire tutors that if she wants to geek out on dinosaurs or math or whatever, that's just like focus on this topic. Yeah. But she wants to go where her friends are going, you know, so it's kind of like a yeah. little bit of, of the dilemma. I, th I think you, you know, you can go the unstructured route or the um, off the beaten path, but it's the same journey when you say i don't want to work for someone else and i want to build something on my own and there is a lot of infrastructure you need to build mm. like there is this story that you know microsoft uh, employees who want to start their own business often fail because there's so much support and infrastructure mm. at microsoft they take it for granted and then when they have to be their own accountants and their own lawyers and their own you know admin person and so on they freak out um but it's the same thing you know we're used to the structure uh uh or you know if, if you if you want if you want to not get married according to the state and be bound to the state or the church and you want to do your own um uh contractual like commitment to your spouse or other mm -hmm. half you still have to think about what happens you know, if one wants to walk out, or if one passes, or if or if some, whatever somebody is like incapacitated in hospital, you have to make yeah. a decision, etc. Yeah. Like, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yeah, true. So the state takes these decisions because other people have thought about it before. But mm -hmm. when we venture into like um, 
a new frontier that's kind of more rebellious that's off the beaten track we still have to figure all of these things out by ourselves well the, the cool thing is that with teal organizations etc there's like other examples of people who have been doing this and um, also with with love not fear we're building a business operating system that helps companies to mm. create a culture with not only culture create a business where people act of can do the job out of love and not out of fear and you know we do like certain things like lifeline exercise or mm -hmm. conscious communication training or like these type of things or emotional intelligence so you, we kind of like set a foundation of like then at some point venturing into a teal organization because like teal organization is like super scary if you just like come come with this so we kind of like want to like baby steps first make the great place to work bring transparency, bring accountability, make people buy in, create a mission and vision that people can really buy in and feel like like tied to that. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious with um, Rethink Culture, what, what do you see are the, the biggest, what makes the biggest difference once, I mean, once you get the score and then what can you implement in your business to have the biggest positive effect on, on culture? Uh... It depends on where you are on the score. So, let me, um, I'll just give you some anecdotal examples. A company that was in low 80s, which is the, one of the highest scores I've measured uh, out of 100. Um, they mostly had to deal with uh, salary uh, increases. Some people were unhappy. Um, they might have to deal with feedback, you know, really small things. The companies that are much lower, there's so many things that can go wrong. So, you, you, you know, you know where to start because it's all quantified. So you see which are the areas that can move the needle the most. So I'll just give you some examples. Mm -hmm. um, the two or three areas that are usually under the water, meaning uh, where companies aren't doing as well, is compensation, which is either people feel they're not competitively paid. Um, for example, developers often feel that because the, there is so much competition for developers out there that the salaries are crazy. Or they feel they're not, um, they're not paid a salary that gives them a comfortable living. Mm -hmm. And that you address with, uh, by, by framing the discussion around a, 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 a benchmark, a salary benchmark. Like uh, a, a public salary benchmark, for example? A, a, yeah, I mean, with public data, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, you can either use a paid service, like Payscale or a free service. Uh, in my other company, we use Read UK salary um, benchmarks, which we then use Numbio, to mm -hmm. adjust them to the country where each employee is based and the cost of living in that country. But once you do that, then it's not about, oh, this friend is making this much on a similar role or that the central bank has announced this much increase in uh, rates or whatever, but this is the norm for this type of job title in this country and it starts from here and goes up to here you're probably at 50 percent or 60 percent and therefore you know um if you increase your performance you can get another 10 percent percentage oh. points like you, you need to frame the discussion that that way in, using an objective measure yes, otherwise, otherwise it's, it's just subjective and it's subject to uh discrimination uh, either uh, perceived or real mm -hmm. and then you have everything around mental health mm -hmm. and physical health like when a company lacks planning systems then you often see uh, everything is urgent mm -hmm. so there's no real distinction between what's important and what's urgent um working towards uh, or to uh, during family times so very very common for managers and generally leadership and anyone to just be emailing at any time in the day or calling at any time in the day 
And thankfully, modern tools now, now like Slack and email and others allow you to schedule for the next day. And I think that is, whenever mm -hmm. I see that, it's a sign of a respectful you know, actually, uh, I, I used to do the same thing. I always like ping people and call them out of the blue. But since we start implementing EOS and they have the level mm. ten meetings, and I found it's it's mm. way more beneficial if the, if I have if I see something it's not going right. Of course, if it's urgent, I call. I don't care. But if um, if I see something that I don't like, I just add it to the level ten meeting notes because then it's out of my mind. I will not forget it, and we address it exactly. Because otherwise, even uh, actually, on, I would not call people on the weekends. But even during the week, they're currently busy with something and I'll just like pull them out of their, their flow that they're currently in, you know, by exactly. sending a Slack message or something. So the level 10 meetings has been really helpful for me uh, um, to not disrupt people, but also for me yeah. to feel good. Like I will not forget it. I'm going to get to it. It's there. I've taken a, a, almost a, an identical approach, the level 10 meeting template and the parked issues, which I took from the parking lot. Concept Copa, of EO. EO. Mm, yeah. So. yeah. Um, and it has so many benefits. So I, I, as an entrepreneur, I'm very impulsive. So I come up with lots of ideas and I used to kind of take an idea and jump at it and like discuss it with my marketing manager back a few years ago. And much later, she said that you would come up with a new idea every week. And I was at some point of almost giving up. And thankfully she didn't. Um, so now I, whenever I have one-to-ones, I have, you know, I put this kind of stream of ideas into the parking lot or parked issues. So when the next meeting comes, we know they're there. I feel safe that they will be addressed and we can just choose what's the most important. And mm -hmm. so urgent things never, uh, become urgent or rarely become urgent because we have, um, a place where they're pinned. And we can get to them at the right time. So that, and, and, that often, is, and often once yeah. you slept over it, the idea is not that great anymore. <laughs> at least exactly. this happens to me. Exactly, exactly. And you see it in perspective, and you say, "What was I thinking?" You know, sometimes like, it's, like what, "What? What was this?" You know, it's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, exactly. Um, another issue that often comes up is healthy conflict. This is so common. Mm -hmm. And Patrick Lancioni talks about this very well. You need to have trust at the baseline. Trust leads to a sense of psychological safety where you're uh, able to share your opinion and talk about what bothers you, even if you, if the people around you might not agree, or if you think that they might not be uh, convinced by your ideas. So healthy conflict is uh, ties a lot to the love, not fear concept, mm -hmm. because it's, I hear what you're saying. This is my view. We're coming at it from different directions. Let's sit down and see what can work best for the both of us. Yeah. Or what can work best for the company, for the team or for the customer? Cause like, that's exactly. like the, the, the end thing. Exactly. Is. So it's being comfortable and feeling safe, safety is just so important, mm. to voice your views, uh, knowing that they won't be shot down, knowing that you won't be accused behind your back or that your chances for promotion will be denied, knowing that your opinion will be respected and listened to, and doesn't mean that it will be um, followed, but that's that that depends on but the heard. decision what's the process but it's so important for you to feel safe as an employee so that you can voice your opinion and know that it will be heard and taken into account mm -hmm. and that often doesn't work and then the other thing that doesn't often work is a sense of ownership and autonomy so autonomy because of the way we um, we build companies based on hierarchy. We typically work by assuming that people need to be managed, need to be told what to do. And that's often a good thing because initiative and responsibility is hard, like we said. Um, but also being told what to do means that by design, you have less of an opportunity 
to um, make your own decisions about what top, what tasks you're going to work on and when you're going to work on them. And so it's finding that that balance. I've I've rarely met companies that do well on uh, on autonomy and ownership. We we just implemented something um, that was an absolute game changer at Upco. So before we had everybody was like a small gear in the machine. Our head of product figured out what kind of mm. features we're going to work on, spec'd it out. Mm. Our product designer made pretty pictures, and then the developer just kind of was almost filling in the colors. You know, like I like didn't mm. really have to think about this. Mm. And then the marketing team took it and deployed it. So kind of like very mm. um, siloed, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And so what we did is first we let everybody do customer support because we want everybody to mm. understand what the customer issues are. First, there were like some resilience, uh, re resistance, but then like, okay, they did it. And um, the second step was we create a pool of things you can work on based on our, our goal for the quarter, what we want to improve in, in, in the in the application. And our head of product just gave a rough ideas of, of things they could pick. We called it the pool of ideas. So we created this pool and then the developer can pick um, one of these pool items and they have to really make a lot of decisions themselves, they have to really apply themselves and use everything in their powers or beings or smarts versus just kind of being the small gear in the, in the machine. Mm. And um, then they deploy it they, the developer announces it by themselves in our community of customers. We have like a forum where, and so they, they post it there. So they also get the praise and the accountability of delivering something that's good because it's transparent. Like, okay, David, I developed this feature and here, here I'm announcing this. And this turned everything around. We have like 300% more output in the team. The customers were like, what's happening? How many people did you hire? Why are you releasing so much? Is this Christmas? That's amazing. So they really lost their mind over this. And also the team culture like really shifted like extreme ownership. And it, it was actually miraculous, um, the, the transformation that we had, like kind of really bringing this, this ownership built into the system. And uh, also the, the ownership in terms of delivering good quality but also being praised for it. This was like, it was, it was really amazing. Um, I find the proximity to the customer is such an important consideration, like for everyone in the company to hear what problems are customers having, what problems are we helping them with rather than feel a cog yes. and maybe sometimes stuck in one's own ideas. Like in, in Slash Data, my other company, we very often have been building stuff just because it was an interesting problem to solve, whether it was the tech team or whether it was a research team doing some kind of fancy algorithm to um, clean the data. Uh, but it was, we, we've had, we've had um, uh, a lot of cases where if we listened to customers, we would have been solving very different problems. Yes, very true. Similar, similar here. Uh, another thing that has been really helpful is drilling mission, vision, values into uh, and our ICP that everybody's really aware of what this is. A friend of mine started Ring.com, the doorbell company, mm -hmm. and uh, I talked to his head of engineering um, about the power of mission and vision, and he told me the story that they have this floodlight that you put on the side of the house. And it has like a camera and two floodlights. And when somebody walks past, the lights go on and you see him on the camera. You can say like, hey, what are you doing on my property? Please leave or call the police. And one of the developers came to him and said like, I have the perfect idea for a feature that we're going to build. We're going to build the party mode. So when party mode is on because it has a microphone and the lights, it will pick up the music and flash with the music. And the developer thought that's the best thing since sliced bread. And... Uh, my buddy could have told him, like, hey, man, that's a stupid idea. Go back to your desk. But he told him, what does this have to do with our mission, which is to make neighborhoods safer? And it's like, eh. mm -hmm. you know, so I guess like this also when you want to yeah. creating an autonomous company, it's very important to be aligned on the mission, the vision, the values, really know this by heart. And also knowing like what's the ideal customer profile or who are we building this for? So it becomes clear on like what, what, are we, what are we actually yeah. do. I think for... Um, autonomous organizations or 
ring-based or circular organizations like self self-management kinds um the only way for these to work is to have a super clear north star like this is the type of company we want to be super clear what com what customers are we addressing what problems are we solving uh purpose how are we doing it and how are we doing it differently and transparency of communication and access to information like if this isn't there there is no way for people to know which direction to go towards mm -hmm. and therefore you default back into a command and control structure Yes, and someone needs it's, to tell you where to go. It's it's for me it's the worst feeling if I have, especially when once you scale up. When I was like more micromanaging, I tell somebody, okay, you go over there, do this, and then you go over there, do this, and then they do this, and then they stop, you know, because they don't know what to do next. So it's like the worst. And it's like really stressing out if I have, if I'm the bottleneck for uh, things to get done. This has always stressed me out massively. There is a very good story about exactly that in David Marquet's Turn the Ship Around. And David Marquet is a, or was a commander or a captain of a famous nuclear submarine. And he was assigned to submarine that he knew nothing about. He had received no training. Mm -hmm. And normally he would know, like a captain would know the ship inside out, like all the shifts and all the different uh, staff, hundreds and so staff, what they were tasked with and know how to inspect the nuclear reactor and so you know the whole thing so the captain would give an order and the submarine would follow so he um in the beginning of his tenure there he gave an order something like forwards two-thirds and the person under him repeated the order but nothing happened and so he started looking around and said what happened? You heard me. And someone said, Captain, there's no forwards two thirds on this sub submarine. <laughs> and then, you know, he asked, why did the person like not speak back? Like, hey, there's nothing like yeah, this. Why did they speak back? But he also repeated the order. <laughs> ah, said, okay. Even though it's right. Repeat, yeah, exactly. I repeated the order because that's what you said. And you're the captain. And that's the default Navy behavior. You're taught to exactly repeat and follow orders. So long story short, he completely changed that culture because he could, could not um, know how, you know, what the right orders were. It was not a submarine he, he was familiar with, but he also said, let's experiment to give more power to the people at every level. And like he says, he turned a leader follower structure into a leader leader structure. It, it really breaks also down to love, not fear. You know, if the person that got there or they would act out of love, he would say like, excuse me, Captain, but this doesn't exist. Versus he was exactly. like out of fear, like, oh, I cannot talk exactly. back. Same with exactly. there was a Turkish Airlines flight. They landed and there was an issue and um, the co-pilot knew that there was an issue and they kind of like, they crash, but not, nobody died. Like just like had, but had some mm. problematic landing because the pilot was older than than him, and out of mm. respect, he didn't dare to speak up just to say it. You know, mm. you know, it was it was it was clear to him. You know, so that that was that's... with an Asian with an Asian airline, I think. I thought I thought it was Turkish Airlines, but could have been a different airline. I okay, I've heard a similar thing about uh, North, uh, sorry, South Korean Airlines. Hmm. Potentially, I got, I got to look it up. A big, a big crash because the staff wouldn't dare speak up. Yes. Yeah. All boils down to love, not fear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you mentioned a lot of things that I absolutely really believe in with the, the communication is like a really big one. Um, how can you teach? Let's, let's talk about this. Like, how can you foster this or what tools or exercise can you give your team that they learn how to communicate nonviolent conscious or how do they bring their point across? Are still being hurt, but not stepping on people's toes. I think you have to have uh, trust to begin with, because without trust, communication is always uh, hindered by mm -hmm. what the other person wants to hear and what you're afraid of saying. 
So trust you build, I think there's two or three, three ways. Uh, and they all have to be reinforced top down because the fish stick, stinks from the head, as we say. So I think the easiest way for me to big, build trust uh, is for people in a team, let's say five or 10 people to start sharing their weaknesses. So you do a Gallup mm -hmm. Strengths Finder or Clifton Strengths, as it's now called, or another test that reveals strengths and non strengths, which are weaknesses. And then you start sharing, um, starting with the leader, what are everyone's weaknesses? So let's say uh, execution, if execution is my weakness, uh, I might say, well, you know, whenever I try and uh, finish a task, I get stuck. And, you know, that's, I realize now why, why, why I get stuck because, um, I have an issue with execution. I come up with all sorts of ideas, but I always get stuck on executing them. And then the next person goes and, and so on, on around the table and you share weaknesses. And that is a powerful tool I learned from uh, Patrick Lencioni's book, The Advantage, where you basically establish trust through vulnerability, but it's not vulnerability, which I, I'm not sharing anything personal. I've taken this psychometric test and it says these things about me, and I'm just commenting on what I saw in that test. So it's a very safe way of creating uh, trust, uh, provided that the leader is willing to, to start with, with vulnerability. So what you're saying is you take a personality test and then you share what the test says, like your weaknesses. And this yes, is a form of being vulnerable. Yeah, yeah it, it, it needs to be a test which reveals strengths and weaknesses. If it's like... A, um if he has dimensions that don't help like a uh, myers-briggs test doesn't like say doesn't talk about strengths or non-strengths yes, everything's great yeah yeah, yeah. Sense, yeah uh it needs to be clear on what are your non, your non-strengths mm. and then another way is of course uh and this needs to be top down is whenever there's a there's a mistake being made what is the next reaction you know do we ask who did it who signed off on it, who didn't respond, or do we look at how to improve the process? This, we have the error log, or now called improvement log, because people want to make it sound nice in my, my companies. Every time something happens that's not good, could be even a small thing, it's added to the error log, which is reviewed by in the level 10 meetings that we have. Mm. And then it's like, what happened? Who was responsible? Like kind of all these things. But then mm. most importantly, A, is it fixed? B, what can we do to make sure this never happens again? And yeah. then we're like a self-healing machine, kind of like, you know, and the mm. rule is you will never get in trouble for making mistakes, but I'll murder you if you don't add it to the error log, you know, that's kind of, because mm -hmm. then, you know, so, and this has been, um, yeah, this has been working, working well for, for my companies. We do a post-mortem mm -hmm. every time that there's a project that finishes and it post-mortem, uh, everyone who's participated in the project gets to add lines to it. And each line is, um, either what went well, what didn't go well, or what could be done better okay. if we were to start the project again. And then it's like an after action review or retrospective, where we look at which of these things are we going to address in the next cycle. Mm -hmm. Not all of them can be addressed, but some will. And this is part of a continuous improvement, the Kaizen process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, from, the, from the dev world. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Uh, very cool. What's your favorite test? Like, is it, I guess it's not Myers Briggs. Is it uh, my favorite so far? Or is it, yeah, my favorite so far is, uh, is the Gallup Strengths Finder. Uh, it's very directional. It helps a lot with comparing strengths across teams. Um, it talks about four different types of strengths. I think it's execution, influencing, um planning or strategy and then there's the one woo. more like inspiration like that's the woo that activator woo like what it was influencing. Okay, yeah. yeah uh it might be people i'm forgetting now but it really helps you assess in a team where you're lacking skills or where you have too many skills uh and helps you have this weaknesses discussion another one which i enjoyed was the <laughs> Belbin test, 
which comes with uh, both which characteristics you have which are strong, but then for each characteristic you have is also a downside. So if, if you overplay that characteristic, it becomes a weakness. Yeah, I mean, like our biggest strength are our biggest weaknesses, like kind of, kind of always, right? That's yeah. pretty cool. F funny, yeah. funny story. My uh, one of our business partners in the previous company, he, we took the Gallup Strength Finder test, and he was like in a very negative state. And he received the test. He opened it up. He scrolled to the very bottom of of the results that he get. And the last thing down there was positivity, but this was the first thing he looked at. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so pretty amusing. QED, as we say in Latin. QED? Uh, there's, QED is the Latin um, uh, initials for it's proven. It is proven. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Very cool. Um, Something else, which um, I'm looking at the kind of pyramid of, of human needs here, which I use for the cultural health score. And something which is always underappreciated is purpose. Mm -hmm. um, most companies do lip service to it by coming with some, coming up with some generic um, vision and mission, uh, which sound good during a board meeting, but doesn't mean much for employees and for people who say okay what does your company do well you know i just clock in and clock out and, and and you know what does it mean for you well so purpose is super important because um it's what lights the fire within each of us um and whether it's the purpose of what the company is achieving for example it's it's a hospital and it's lives uh or it's how we help each other at work so my work is important because i can make my colleagues smile when i help them or my work is important because three months ago we went with my colleagues to the mountain and reforested the areas that were burned down or mm. we gathered garbage that was lining up the coast or we fed the people in need the um you know the the undernourished uh or another sense of purpose is i have a strong feeling of wanting to beat the competition and that's something we thrive on as mm -hmm. a team yeah yeah uh, toyota had at some point, like in the 70s or so, their vision statement was destroy Yamaha, <laughs> which, I <personally, laughs> which I personally don't think is, is a good thing to, to go that direct. But I think this also motivates people. But I, I really agree. I have a great example in this this manner. Um, people being, you know, want to be, also, it goes really into the love, not fear principle. You want to do something that has purpose. You want to be of something, you know, do good in the world, be of something, a part of something bigger. Um, otherwise, work is, is kind of meaningless, I guess. A friend of mine, Liam, he runs Time Doctor. It's a time tracking software. And uh, if their mission would be to become the number one time tracking software in the world, probably 0.3% of their employees would be excited about this. Probably nobody, you know, mm -hmm. not even themselves. But their vision statement is to empower the world's transition towards remote work. And mm -hmm. they're all cr crazy about it. Companies mm -hmm. thriving. Mm -hmm. People are super excited about this. Mm -hmm. Now they, he wrote a book on the topic. They have the biggest conference called Running Remote uh, about this topic. Mm -hmm. And also kind of once you kind of really figure something out where people are passionate about, and this can be even time tracking, which is somewhat boring. Um, but if you frame it in the proper way, you can even turn something like this into something really yeah. amazing. I think it's at the end of the day, it's quite simple. The framing needs to be around how the company alongside many other companies not on its own is helping make a positive dent Impact. to society 100%. and it's not just that i mean even if you are in a boring company um you can or a, a company with a boring mission you can think about empowering or inspiring employees with how they can make a difference to each other's mm -hmm. lives how they make a difference to the environment 
to the customers' and how lives. They yeah, and how they unite against the competition. All of these are very powerful purposes and motivations. Yep. I guess, like I said, like contributing to humanity, purely acting out of love. You know, just but mm -hmm. I think this this is really what what we all are craving. They made like this test where they gave. Twenty dollars to students, and at the end of the day, they asked them like, you know, they told them like, either fifty percent should give it to somebody else, and fifty percent should buy themselves something. Mm -hmm. And then they, at the end of the day, they asked them like, how happy they mm -hmm. were that day, and the ones that gave away like were way, way happier. You know, abundance yes. versus scarcity mindset. Yeah, yeah. There, there is undeniably something um, that connects the cosmic energy around us with our sense of happiness. And so when, when, you know, it, or it's also called good karma, you know, when mm -hmm. you do good, the, that good, good karma comes to you. returns, it's like a boomerang it returns to you. What's the vision uh, and slash mission of Rethink Culture? That was one of the first things I came up with and it was like, okay, yeah, of course, it. it makes sense, which is to help one million companies create healthier happier cultures it's beautiful and and to me it's simple and it's it's it came naturally because i really have seen a lot of toxic cultures and there is an unbelievable number of toxic cultures out there which i'm not aware of so if through the company i can help create awareness like you said earlier with your uh, employee and especially a positive change into a large number of companies, I know that there will be so much, you know, happier people in the world because we spend eight plus hours a day into work. And so if we have meaning, if we have fulfillment, if we have safety, if we have connection, if we have recognition, if we have all of these things, um, we'll, uh, We'll, we'll create a happier happier society, happier self, happier family. And to add to this, for those who only think, I want to make more money, who are like in this scarcity mindset, um, according to a Gallup study, uh, Gallup Foundation study, 59% of employees are disengaged at work. Now imagine how productive, how much more output you're going to have if almost everybody in your company is excited about what you're doing, and is thriving, really applying their entire being to this because they're excited about this versus just like doing the tasks that they're being told to do out of fear, being micromanaged. You know, I think this is going to be, um, it's, it's, it would be very stupid not to go that route. Liz Wiseman says something similar that in, in companies where people are mismanaged or where there are a lot of accidental micromanagers or diminishers as she she calls them uh, on average people are using 40 percent of their capabilities and where they're being helped to shine they use 80 or 90 percent so if you're not conscious about your culture if you're not intentional about your culture you are not addressing people's fundamental needs for safety, for connection, for belonging, for esteem, for actualization, for synergy. And therefore, you're only... You, you're paying, you're paying 100% and you're only getting 40% of, exactly. of what they could do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's per person. You know, if you, if you count, if you add to that how much politics and how much people are standing in each other's way rather than helping each other that creates even more you know waste yes, for your true. investment very true and, and we're not we're not resources right we're not human resources true uh, yes we, the, we ter the term persists but we are humans with our idiosyncrasies and we want to be inspired we we want to have uh, our address, uh, our, our needs addressed and are unfulfilled. And uh, I think employers everywhere need to understand the difference between human resources and human capital and human needs. I think that's, that's a perfect wrap, Andres. Thank you very much for being on the show. 
to be continued. I'd love to nerd out with you more on this topic. Um, Let's do that. How can people find you? Uh, rethinkculture.co is the uh, the web address for Rethink Culture. Um, if you want to have your, if you're curious and you want to see how your culture stacks up and you want to see an X-ray of your culture, then fill in the, the form. And you can also find me on LinkedIn, uh, and I'm quite quite active there. We'll we'll include the links in the show notes and also the Rethink Culture podcast. Also check it out. There's a link on the homepage. Again, Andreas, thank you very much for being on the show. Really appreciate you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you, David.